So we're good. All right. Uh, so welcome to the, the second lecture for interactive computer graphics. Our, our topic for today is going to be the background that you will need for this course. So we're not going to start actually talking about specifically interactive computer graphics. Uh, we're going to be talking about the stuff that you need so that we can talk about interactive computer graphics. So for those of you who have taken introduction to computer graphics, you will recognize the slides that I will be using today. I'm going to be rehashing the slides that I used for interactive computer graphics for the most part, but I'm going to go through them pretty quickly here because the, the point of this lecture is to give you guys an overview about the stuff that we need to know in this course. So if you feel like um, you know, your background is lacking in any of these topics, I would highly recommend that you uh, watch the related lectures for introduction to computer graphics available online, talking about the, the same topics, but in a lot more detail than I plan to do today. All right, so that's, that's the plan for today. All right, so let's start with raster images, images. That's what we're going to be producing, right? So we're going to produce an image that's the output of rendering. So what does an image look like? You should have some idea, an image is a raster image is made, uh, made out of pixels. Now, now look at the order that I'm presenting these pixels. This is what we call the scan line order, right? From left to right, top to bottom. That's the scan line order. So an, a raster image made out of all these pixels will have a width and a, a height, and we refer to those as the resolution of the image, like basic stuff. Uh, we typically store them in interleaved order, like, like this, like RGB, 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 RGB for each pixel. So you can think of that, this as like a 1D array for representing a 2D image, right? Array starts from here, it goes on like this, and then goes to the next row in the scanline order. All right, so 1D array of scanline order. So that's the typical way of storing pixels. Uh, but you will, um, well, you may or may not see inside a GPU, uh, on the GPU, uh, sometimes uh, GPUs prefer storing data like images in swizzled order. So in the swizzled order, we're not really following the scanline order, but instead we're, we're one way of doing swizzling is following the Z curve. This is just one way of doing swizzling. There are uh, different swizzling patterns. The reason for that is that it provides a bit more locality when you're accessing images. So if I want to access this pixel and the pixel right above it, it's going to be closer in memory. It just improves cache performance. That, that's why GPUs oftentimes store images in some swizzled order. But when we're accessing the, the images on the GPU, we can typically access them in scanline order. So like we were going to take images from GPU memory, move them to our CPU memory so we can, we can uh, play with them. At that point, they will be in scanline order. So that's the typical thing to do for CPUs. Uh, but on the GPU, they may or may not be in scanline order. Just a general idea about how images could be stored. Okay, going back, raster image. It's made out of pixels, right? But this is, um, this is not a very good way of representing pixels, right? So uh, pixels are actually more like these. A pixel is not a little square, right? A pixel uh, determines a point sample, a, a, a value at a point, uh, typically at, at the value of some 2D function at the center of the pixel location. So that's what the pixel actually means. So imagine that our 2D function is an image that looks like this. Our pixels are going to be the values at the centers of these pixel locations, at these locations, right? at, at the centers of the, these grid locations, we're going to have our values. And that's a, that's a more proper way of thinking about pixels instead of thinking them as, uh, as little squares. But of course, if I don't have, if I don't have enough pixels, I won't be able to represent an image like this in its full detail. If I have an, a raster image that is, what is this? Eight by eight, eight by eight pixels. That's the resolution. You know, all these details will not, I won't be able to represent them because I don't have enough pixels. So what, what I can represent is an image that looks more like this. So it's like a blurred version of that image. The way we refer to that is uh, like all these details that are, that are lost here, like all these details that are lost when we switch to 
this blurry version, we call them the high frequency details. And they're called high frequency because the change of, let's say, color from one pixel to the neighboring pixel uh, is very sudden and very strong. So, and, and I'm sort of skipping all the details about what, where high, high frequency comes from. But we, we, we refer to them as high frequency details. So if, I, if you ever hear me saying high frequency details or low frequencies, this is what I mean by low frequencies. And high frequencies are whatever is missing here, right? This is, they have some high frequencies all like gone. We have this blurry image, right? Because we don't have enough pixels. So this is a more proper way of thinking about pixels. We, ha we have this 2D function and our pixels are just samples of that 2D function. All right, there's also alpha. What is alpha? Now, obviously the first letter of the Greek alphabet, right? <laughs> That's not what I mean. Uh, alpha has a very specific meaning in the context of computer graphics. We use it to, to mean opacity, right? So that is, if uh, we have a fully transparent object or a pixel, its, it's alpha is going to be zero. If it's fully opaque, its alpha is going to be one, right? So if I include alpha in my raster images for each pixel, I am going to have a color value and alpha. Uh, so I have RGBA, A, A is for alpha, all right? So uh, this is a very convenient representation because if I'm using eight bits per color channel, which is a typical thing to do, then I'm gonna have 32 bits for representing RGBA, which is pretty convenient, right? It's just, just a word size. So four bytes of 32 bits, RGBA. So, you know, we, we store them like so, RGBA, RGBA, RGBA in the interleaved format, uh, and they could be stored in scanline order or interleaved uh, format, uh, however it's stored. So this is a very uh, general idea about what a raster image is. Now I'm skipping the discussion of what color is. You know, that's a big topic actually. You may think that color is something simple, but it isn't. It's actually a very, very complicated thing but I'm skipping the whole discussion about color and all that stuff. Although it is definitely related because it's a very fundamental topic for computer graphics. Yeah, you know, this is a very specific course about interactive computer graphics, so I'm gonna have to skip some things. I can't talk about everything that's related to computer graphics. So, I move on. Uh, continuing on the background, our next stop is vectors and matrices. Again, I'm gonna rush through this quite a bit, but let's set our notation. This is a vector. It's a 3D vector. It has three scalar components. Um, I'm going to be using, I will be using bold characters for representing vectors and uh, italicized characters for representing scalars. Vector made out of three scalars. Vector operations. You should be, you guys should be very, very comfortable with these, these things like adding two vectors together. Obviously you get this resulting vector or you can subtract the vectors. You know, if you, you get this. Uh, dot product, very, very important operation. The dot product of two vectors will give us a scalar, a scalar value defined by this, right? You basically multiply together the, the components. And we can try to figure out the projection of this vector onto this other vector. So the length uh, of this, this projection, this D value. In this case, if the vector B is a unit vector, that is its length is one, then this length D is going to be A dot B, all right? And so I'm not saying anything about A. A can be, can have any length. B is a unit vector, its length is one, A can be anything, all right? Uh, and, and then if V is a unit vector, then the, it's, their dot product is going to give, give us the projection of A onto in the direction of B, uh, that length. Uh, if B is not a unit vector, then you just divide it by the length of B. That, that's how you get D, right? And this is a very fundamental operation we're going to be using. And we're also going to be using it for determining the angle between two vectors. Uh, the dot product gives you the cosine of the angle multiplied by the lengths of these two vectors. So if, the, if these are unit vectors, the dot product will give me the cosine of the angle between them, and we're going to be using it for quite a lot of things. Um, again, dot product can also be used for checking if two vectors are perpendicular to each other. If they are perpendicular, the 
cosine of the angle between them is going to be zero, so the dot product is going to be zero. Right? So we can use dot product to check if two vectors are perpendicular to each other. So here are other properties of dot product, um, associativity, distributivity, uh, commutativity, uh, dot products or uh, properties of dot product. Another kind of product that we're going to need to be familiar with is going to be cross product. In this case, A cross B, using the right-handed rule, you get this uh, direction in 3D. And, and this is the opposite of that, minus A cross B. So because of that, so the cross product, you, you can just swap the order of vectors in cross product. Uh, you, you get a, the, the, opposite, uh, the opposite direction. So, so you kind of need to put a minus if you're going to switch the order. So these are the properties of cross product that you guys should be familiar with. Uh, for matrices, well, there's a lot that can be said about matrices, which I am not going to. Uh, the stuff that we're going to be doing with matrices is going to be relatively simple. So we're going to be using matrices, but we're not going to be doing too much with matrices. We're going to be doing basic operations. So this is a three by three matrix. The stuff that I'm going to be talking about in the rest of this, this lecture will be very closely related to using matrices. So in this case, a three by three matrix, I'm going to be using capital bold characters, uppercase bold characters for representing matrices. So in this case, it's showing a multiplication operation, which is one of the operations that we're going to be doing with matrices. A times B is not equal to B times A. That's, that's very important. The order is very, very important. Now, I'm going to repeat this. The order is very important. This is, this is going to come up many times as you're implementing things. It's more than likely that at least once you will be writing a, a matrix, matrix multiplication in the wrong order and everything will fall apart because you're going to get the wrong matrix. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, this is one of the things you should check. If you have a bug in your code, you're getting the wrong matrix and things are not looking as they should. You, you might be multiplying matrices in the wrong order. That's, uh, that's definitely something you should, you should check. Another thing that we're going to be doing with matrices is that we're going to be multiplying vectors with matrices. Right? So that's going to be the fundamental use case for us. We're going to be dealing with vectors a lot in, in 3D. Uh, our models and 3D environments uh, will be represented with vectors, and we're going to be transforming these vectors using uh, matrices, um, different types of matrices. Um, and I'll talk about how we do that in a little bit. So this is going to be the fundamental operation. But for being able to generate the matrix that we want, we will be doing matrix matrix multiplications. All right, so vectors and matrices can be a big topic. There's a lot that can be done with uh, matrices in particular. But you, you will see how we're, we will be using them uh, when, we're when I'm talking about transformations. So um, that's the extent of the matrix related operations that you guys should be familiar with. All right, let's move on. Let's dive into transformations. Uh, so for transformations are going to be things that we're going to be using for building our scenes, building our 3D scenes. So we're going to be using them to place objects in certain positions. And more specifically, we're going to be using affine transformations. Uh, these are a, a form of linear transformations. These are the simplest types of transformations we can, uh, we can use for um, moving vectors around. So what are affine transformations? We have translation, which now takes an object and moves it to a different position, right? We have rotation, takes an object and rotates it. We have scale, takes an object and scales it. We have skew. Skew, do you know what skew looks like? Looks like this. All right, so what skew is actually a combination of rotation and scale. So you can do skew by, you know, take something, rotate it first, and then scale in some direction, and then rotate it back. That turns into skew. So I'm not, I'm not going to talk about skew, right? So it's just a combination of rotation and scale. So these are the, the basic affine transformations that we, that we have. So let's um, go over them in 2D first. 
and talk about how we can uh, handle different types of transformations in 2D. Uh, we're going to be applying them to vectors for translation. I'm basically going to be moving vectors, right? So when I have a vector, when I talk about vectors, it's very important to think about a coordinate frame. A vector on its own means absolutely nothing. It has no meaning, right? A vector must live inside a coordinate frame. Right? We need to provide the context. Without the context, the vectors have absolutely no meaning. So a vector in 2D will have two scalar components, but for me to be able to understand what those two scalar components mean, I need to have a coordinate frame. So this in this coordinate frame, this is the origin where vector 0, 0 lives. Uh, and this is the x direction, and this is the y direction, right? So if I have a vector like this, that's going to be, yeah, that's going to, be, this is going to be its x and y coordinates, all right? So with translation, what am I going to do? I'm going to take this position represented by this vector, and I'm going to be moving it to some other location, such as this, right? So this is going to be the translation operation. So if I start with vector p, I ended up with vector p prime, p prime. Uh, and so this is the translation I have, the translation vector t. So basically what translation did is it took vector p, it added t to it, vector t to it, and I got p prime. All good? All right. Uh, so yeah, this is the vector notation. I can also write it in scalar form like this. It's just the vector addition. All right, simple enough. Uh, moving on, scale. Scale is going to scale a vector, right? So if I have a vector like this, and if I scale it, it's going to scale in the same direction like this, from, from p to p prime, if this is uniform scale, right? if I'm using uniform scale. So uniform scale is going to, well, it's going to just uh, multiply the vector with some scalar. So it's, just, it's not changing the direction of the vector, it's just multiplying each one of its components by a scalar. But that's uniform scale. Uh, Non-uniform scale will be scaling x and y components differently. So if I apply non-uniform scale to a vector, its direction is going to change, right? Uh, so I, I scale in one direction and scale in the other direction. So from, I went from p to p prime like this using non-uniform scale. So in this case, I can't quite write it like this because I'm multiplying uh, components with, with different scalars. Uh, so this, this notation is not going to work out. So I, I will, but I can write it individually something like this, right? Uh, I multiply x by sx, y by sy. All right, so this is scale. Simple enough, rotation. Rotation is going to rotate an object um, around the origin. So in this case, this point is the origin. Uh, let's say I have a vector like this with rotation. I'm rotating this vector uh, from p to p prime. That's how I went and rotated by an angle theta. And I can write the rotation like so. Uh, so this is going to be the... Yeah, I, I'm not doing the derivation of, uh, of this here. Um, the x component is going to be multiplied by this and y component is going to be multiplied by this. And we're going to get the resulting rotation like so. Now, this looks a bit more complicated than, than the other ones, right? The other ones looked quite simple, translation and scale. Uh, this looks a bit more complicated. Um, so the notation here simplifies quite a bit if I use a, a matrix notation. So if I convert these, these things that I'm multiplying the x and y comp comp uh, co components, uh, and I put them into a matrix, so this is a two by two matrix multiplied by a vector, right? Um, and that's going to give me the, the transform, the, the rotated uh, vector here, right? So this matrix notation is quite helpful here for representing, uh, representing rotations. All right, but can I do something like this for scale? Yeah, I can do the same thing for scale, right? I can use a uh, matrix notation for scale as well. So in this case, this is the matrix notation for scale. In this case, this matrix is a diagonal matrix. I'm going to have zeros for off-diagonal values and only along the diagonal I'm going to have 
along the diagonal uh, here. I'm going to have uh, non-zero elements. All right? And that's equivalent to writing this. This was exactly the formula. So we can basically represent scale as a matrix multiplication. All right? Um, actually, it turns out that any 2 by 2 matrix that you can come up with, uh, you can represent it as a combination of rotation and scale. Uh, the way to do that would be you can take a matrix M and apply what we call a singular value decomposition, SVD. And by singular value decomposition, we get three matrices multiplied together, these three matrices, and that's typically how they're represented. But in the end, uh, what you need to know here is that they're going to be, there's going to be a, a rotation. Uh, you know, we're starting from this side first. We, we're going to have a rotation first, and then scale, and then some other rotation. Any 2 by 2 matrix, any 2 by 2 matrix you can think of, is going to have this form. Right? That, that's a very important property. Any 2 by 2 matrix is going to be rotation, scale, and then rotation. That's why skew ended up being rotation, scale, and then rotation. Because right? anything becomes rotation, scale, and then rotation, if it can be represented as a 2 by 2 matrix. So while that's in 2D, it's actually a bit more general. Uh, we can represent any, okay, any square matrix using singular value decomposition. Actually, you can even do singular value decomposition to any matrix. It doesn't even have to be square. But then these matrices are not going to be square matrices. So pretty much anything you can sort of think of as a, a rotation, scale, and rotation again. A crazy property. Here's a nice thing. Think about any kind of transformation that you can do uh, that's going to apply that we're going, let's say that we have an object and i'm going to rotate it and scale it and rotate it again and scale it again and rotate it again and scale it again and in the end so i'm going to have rotation matrices followed by scale scale matrices or rotation matrices scale by matrices uh, i'm going to apply i can apply a series of rotations and scale and this whole thing is going to turn into a single matrix right so i can just uh i can apply a series of transformations and I can combine all of those into a single matrix, right? And this is a very, very, very important property because uh, especially for interactive rendering, we're going to have objects with lots of vertices, meaning lots of vectors. And we're going to be transforming all of these, uh, all of these uh, vectors together at the same time with the same, well, I'm going to apply the same transformations. And those transformations, the way that you place an object in a scene, might be quite complicated. Like I can apply repeated rotations and scales and other rotations. But regardless of what I do and what order I do, I can just multiply all, all these matrices together, get one matrix, and use that one matrix as my transformation matrix. Uh, so that simplifies this, this whole process quite a bit because this one matrix alone represents all of the operations that I had done. And, and I can just use that one matrix vector multiplication and, and get the transformed position like this. So the question is, how about translation? Where does that fit? It doesn't fit, right? Doesn't fit at all. I mean, two by two matrices will have rotation and scale, but does not, they don't have any translation. Uh, would it be nice if I could write translation as a matrix? Right? But translation is an operation like this. It's not multiplication, it's addition. Uh, so if I have translation, I can just say, oh, I have all this stuff, and plus I have some translation. This, is, this works, right? A, a series of rotations and scales plus, plus some translation. But what if, what if I apply additional translation? So I take an object, I rotate it and move it around, and then I rotate it again and move it again. So if I, were to, if I were to take this and apply rotation to it, uh, then I'm going to get a matrix. I'm going to have an operation like this. So this is making things complicated. Um, so the question is, why do I care? Can I just translate something only once? Like just put your object wherever you want it to be and keep it there. Why are you keep translating and doing things? This is because... Um, uh, certain operations are very hard to do without it. For example, when we talked about rotation, I told you rotation is around, around the origin. So I have 
a keyboard in front of me. Well, you're not seeing the keyboard, you're seeing the back of the keyboard. <laughs> All right, so if this corner is the origin and I rotate it, I rotate it around that origin. But if I want to rotate my, my keyboard around its center, I cannot do that, right? If I want to rotate it around its center here, I need to first translate it, translate it to the origin, rotate it, and then translate it back, back to where it was. So this is how I define rotation uh, around an arbitrary point. Uh, because of that, I need to combine translations and rotations together. And this sort of notation is not allowing me to do that. And this is very convenient for scale and rotation only, but as soon as I introduce translations, things get more complicated. To get around that complexity, we're going to go into this uh, lovely notation that's uh, homogeneous coordinates. So it's a, it's a trick, homogeneous coordinates. What it allows us to do is to take an operation like this, like a, an addition operation, and turns it into a matrix multiplication. <laughs> yes, we took addition, which is quite simple, and turn it into a matrix multiplication, which is a lot more complicated, but it will allow us to uh, unify the notation for all of our affine transformations. Now, this is a little tricky to do, like how are you going to do this, right? Because this, this operation, this addition, is definitely not a multiplication. So what can, what can I do to get a matrix that will actually do addition? It doesn't, you cannot do that. So the way we're going to do is that we're gonna uh, use homogeneous coordinates and we're gonna cheat we're going to add an additional coordinate here. So we're going to treat this 2D vector as if it's a 3D vector. And this, this last coordinate here is going to be 1. And we're going to be using this 1 for cheating such that we can get a, a matrix, um, 2 by 3 matrix like this. So uh, here, the, the first, the 2 by 2 component here is just an identity matrix, uh, 1, 0, 0, 1 an identity matrix that's not going to do anything. And this part is going to be multiplied by this one here. So basically, this matrix vector multiplication is equivalent to exactly this. All right? And by, by doing so, we sort of, we manage to represent translation as a matrix multiplication. Now, this is a two by three matrix, that's not very good. I don't like that. I would like to have square matrices. So if I wanna use uh, homogeneous coordinates all the way through and I wanna have a, a vector with homogeneous coordinates at the end, I can just extend this, this matrix with an additional row that is zero, zero, one. All right, so this zero, zero, one is gonna be multiplied by this vector and the result is going to be one, All right? It, no, as long as, as long as this is one, and this part is 0, 0, 1, I'm going to get 1, regardless of what the x and y co components are, right? So this is our homogeneous coordinate representation. The nice thing here is that I am representing, I am representing transformations in 2D, but I'm using 3D vectors in homogeneous coordinates and 3, three by 3 matrices. And by doing so, now I can represent all sorts of combinations of translations and rotations and scale in whatever combination, and they will all turn into a single matrix. And that single matrix is going to be representing the transformation in homogeneous coordinates. Here I've represented its, its, its components as a, a, B, C, D, E, F, and the bottom row is going to be 0, 0, 1. All right, so that's affine transformations in 2D. All right, let's, let's move on. 3D affine transformations fairly similar to the 2D ones. In 2D, I have a three by three matrix. In 3D, I'm gonna have a four by four matrix if I'm using homogeneous coordinates. Exactly the same idea, right? So if I have scale, I'm gonna have a scale matrix like this. I, have, I will have the diagonal values along here, just like in the 2D case. It's gonna be a diagonal matrix that the bottom row is gonna be 0, 0, 0, 1 in 3D. Uh, for translation, this part is going to be uh, an identity matrix and my translation components in X, Y, and Z are going to be over here and the bottom row is always going to be 0, 0, 1. Uh, rotation is a bit more tricky because in 3D there are different types of rotations. So it's not just... Um, so in, in 2D when we talked about rotation, I said is rotation is around the, the center, around the, the origin. 
but in in 3D, we also need to specify an axis to rotate something around, not just the, uh, the origin. Uh, so yes, it's this, if I rotate this, it's going to be rotating around the origin, but in which direction? So I need to pick an, a rotation axis. If I rotate it around X, this is what it's going to look like, right? If I rotate it around Y, this is what it's going to look like. If I rotate it around Z, this is what it's going to look like. Actually, I can take an object and rotate it around any any axis that I want, right? So if it doesn't look like it's rotating around uh, around this this vector, uh, we just, we can just look at it from that perspective, and you'll see that it's actually rotating around that. Anyhow, so I can have a rotation around any axis. Uh, a nice thing here is that it turns out I can represent rotation around any any axis, any direction that I pick, uh, I can represent it as a combination of rotations around x, y, and z. All right, so that's a, that's a nice feature of, of rotation. Uh, so the rotation matrices, now I have three different rotation matrices, rotation around x, rotation around y, rotation around z. The rotation around z should, is the one that should look familiar to you. That looks like the 2D rotation matrix. But, you know, we have X and, and Y. Now, um, there are two different ways of writing these matrices. Um, so this minus sign is up here in this case, minus sign is there, minus could be over here or there. Uh, so if I rotate in the opposite direction, if I, instead of rotating clockwise, if I rotate counterclockwise, then my angle is going to be negative and for cosine, the, the, the sign of the angle doesn't really matter. It, cosine theta and cosine minus theta, that would be the same thing. But for sine, it matters. Sine minus theta is minus sine theta. So uh, depending on how you define your rotation, uh, clockwise or counterclockwise, the matrix that you're going to be writing will have the, the minus sign here in different places, either uh, for this sign uh, or this sign theta. All right. So if you see... Uh, Rotation matrices that place the, the minus sign over here, just know that it's the, the opposite of the rotation, uh, opposite direction of the rotation that I'm using here. Basically, theta is minus theta. All good? What's important here is to remember that um, the order is important. So, rotation around x and then around y and then around z here. Uh, this is not the same thing as rotation around x and then z and then y. That's not the same. Like these are the same angles, but the order is important, right? Because of properties of matrix multiplication, I can't just change the order of matrices and get the same results. It's it's the result is going to be different. Uh, and again, it's not the same thing as rotating around y and then x and sorry and then z and then x and and whatever. Like all all of these different combinations would give you a different rotation. Now, again, let me remind you again, what's important here is the order, and the order goes from here to there. Like, you, you start from the right side, okay? So, because if I multiply this by, okay, let, let's pick the first one. If I multiply this one with a, a vector, I'm gonna put the vector right here on the right-hand side, right? So that vector is going to be multiplied by this, this matrix first, and the result will be multiplied by this, and the result will be multiplied by that. Or yeah, I can just combine all of them and have one matrix, but, but the effect is going to be exactly the same, right? So first this rotation is applied, and then this, and then this. That order, that order is very, very, very important. So it's, a, it's a common mistake to write the matrices in the wrong order, and if you do, uh, you know, you, you should you should figure it out by remembering that the order of matrices is very important. All right, let's move on to our to another one of our background topics that's going to be about viewing. All right, moving on. This is the background stuff stuff that I expect all of you to know. But if you if you don't, this is going to be just a, a quick overview. All right, viewing. Viewing, what do we do? So I have an object like this, and I would like to, to look at it from a certain direction. And I want to, let's say I'm, I'm looking at it like this, right? And so the 
what I see is an image that looks like this, right? So this that, that this is what I see. Uh, so you can think about this as like I'm, you know, I have this screen and I'm looking at it, and uh, this is the image that I am seeing. All right. So we're gonna do viewing transformations that will allow me to to place this this object into um, into the direction that I'm looking at. All right. So that's 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 the goal. All right. So imagine that this this is a monitor. Imagine that there's a virtual world behind it, right? So there's a, uh, I'm going to have a 3D world behind it. So I'm going to extend it like this, or right? there's a 3D world behind it. And that I have something in that 3D world, some, some object, all right? So this lovely dinosaur. Uh, and I would like to be able to uh, see what it would look like on the screen. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to take this 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 object this this model this character and I'm going to be uh, transforming it onto my screen space like this and this is how I will know what this object would look like on this screen if I'm looking at it from this this direction right so that's that that's the idea that's what we're trying to accomplish now we're going to start with defining a coordinate frame uh, let's pick an origin where would you like to place the origin well, the obvious place to pick will be the center of my monitor. Why not? <laughs> all right, so I'm looking at this like this, all right? So the horizontal direction is going to be x. I'm, I'm going to pick the horizontal direction as the x direction and the vertical direction as the y direction. So where is the z direction then? If this is x and this is y with right-handed, using right-handed coordinate frame, z should be pointing towards me. Right? So that would be the z direction. And this is going to be our, uh, the coordinate frame that we will be using for representing uh, this, uh, this space that we see. Uh, we will call this the camera or view space. Right? In the view space, this is where my objects are going to be. And what I can see inside this view space is going to be the view volume. Now, I'm defining this because um, when we are pre preparing a scene, we're going to be doing all sorts of transformations because our objects, like well, how, how do you define a scene in 3D? We define a scene by taking some objects and placing them wherever you like. Like imagine as if you're decorating your house. Like I have some chairs and table and these models are prepared in their own space. Now, now this chair does not have anything else around it. So some person just prepared this chair model for me. And, you know, this model is defined by a bunch of vectors. And for those vectors to mean something, there has to be a coordinate frame. And that coordinate frame is going to be the frame, the coordinate frame that is used for modeling that, that chair the, or the, this table. And that coordinate frame is what we're going to uh, refer to uh, as uh, the model or object space. So our objects will be given initially in their own object spaces, in their own model spaces, right? And we're going to take these objects and we're going to place them wherever we like, wherever we want in our scene. Uh, so I'm going to have a scene and that scene is going to have its own uh, coordinate frame. We typically refer to that as the world space or the scene space. Uh, and I'm going to be transforming my objects to wherever I would like them to be in this scene or world space. And, and those are going to be uh, what we call the model transformations. Now, these transformations are affine transformations, so they can Im include a series of rotations and scales and translations. And all of these are going to be combined into a single transformation matrix. That's going to be a four by four, but the bottom row being zero, 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 one. It's going to be a four by four transformation matrix uh, that will define the position and orientation and scale of each one of my objects in my scene. Right? So I took them from their model space. I transformed them into uh, my scene or world space. Now, this is not enough because uh, what I need to know is where these objects are going to be in my view space, right? So I need to transform them. 
I need to transform this entire world, the entire virtual world into the, the view space or the camera space. And that's going to be the view transformation. So this is my camera space. In my camera space, you know, X is, X is horizontal, Y is vertical, and Z is pointing behind my view direction, at the opposite of my view direction. So uh, from the scene, scene in world space, I go to view space with this view transformation. Again, this is going to be another four by four matrix, right? And in the view space, I'm going to be seeing my object like this. So it's as if I have this, 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 this camera that's uh, looking at it like so. All right. So um, when we're um, rendering, we, there's, a, there's going to be a part of the scene that's going to be visible to us and a part of the scene that's not going to be visible, right? Where the camera is looking at it, a part of it, uh, the, the scene will be visible. And that part that is visible, we're going to refer to that as the view volume. So I'm going to have my object inside the view volume and everything inside the view volume, I will be able to see it on the screen. Anything that's outside of the view volume, uh, it's going to be not visible. This view volume is defined by its, um, its extents. Typically, I'm going to have uh, you know, the, the, the left hand side, like uh, it's so hard to show uh, the over here, the, the, that side. <laughs> that's, let's call it L, uh, left and right, bottom and top. Uh, and also there's going to be far and near. So it's not going to be you know, touching my screen. So there's going to be a, a, a box here that's going to define my view volume in, uh, in the view space. And we call this view volume the, the canonical view volume. View space is the 3D camera space. But this is this, this what we see here is the canonical view volume. And that's what we will be seeing. It's, this is not the world space. This is the canonical view volume. So um, after we transform all of our objects to the camera or view space, we're going to have another transformation that will bring everything to the canonical view volume. All right, so from the view, view camera space, we're going to transform everything to the canonical view volume. Uh, and we call that projection transformation. The simplest one being orthographic projection. Right, so, for, so for orthographic projection, here's how it works. Um, I have my uh, camera view. Again, it has this left and right and uh, bottom and top and, and uh, near and far. These are going to be my, my coordinates defined in camera view space. And when I do uh, orthographic projection, it's going to transform my vectors from this space to the canonical view volume. And in the canonical view volume, all these coordinates will be from minus one to one. All right. And our GPUs or the rendering operations done on the GPUs uh, using rasterization. And I'll talk about rasterization later on, not in this lecture, but next week. It's going to be using the canonical view volume for determining where any, any vector, any object is. All right. So this is like the the standard, standard coordinate frame that we would like to bring everything to. And from this point on, we can start generating the image. All right, so this is where our transformations are going to end. So all of our transformations, starting with the, from model space to world space, and then to view camera space, the, the, the whole goal is to, to come to here, this, to, to this canonical view volume. All right? So, in the view space, in the camera space, I have the coordinates for the rightmost extent of my view volume, the leftmost, and the top and the bottom, and the near and far. Now I need to figure out a way to transform my vectors to this canonical view volume. How am I going to do that with orthographic projection? I'm going to do that with a projection matrix. Now, the orthographic projection is not going to change my this this, this uh, fourth coordinate the, the homogeneous coordinate so the bottom row is going to be zero 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 one right now what it's going to do is that it's not going to rotate anything right it's just going to scale my vectors and maybe translate them 
So um, there's going to be some scale here, this diagonal components, and there's going to be some translation over here. But the off-diagonal elements here are going to be zeros because I'm not going to have any, any rotation from view space to, to canonical view volume. All right, so this is going to be my orthographic projection. So what it's going to have to do is it's going to have to scale my vectors such that they fit inside this minus one to one box. And to be able to do that, I just need to move things to the, the center and I need to, to scale them. So these are the scale factors from left to right and these are the translation factors. And that's going to be our orthographic projection matrix and it can be written like this, right? So this is our orthographic projection matrix. So this is just that simplified version of this matrix. It's the same matrix, just uh, simplified. Okay, orthographic projection. Looks great. You look at it, looks great, right? Doesn't look so bad. Or does it? It kind of looks awkward. It looks a little bit weird, doesn't it? I mean, it doesn't look like yeah, I'm, I'm seeing this teapot in these boxes, but they kind of look... Don't they look a little strange to you? They don't look very natural. It's just... Everything is... I mean, it's right, maybe? They don't look like like this. Oh, this is more like what I see when I look at something. The other one is... I don't know what it is. It's just weird. Uh, so that's that's orthographic projection for you. It's very simple. And it's very useful for all sorts of engineering applications, but it doesn't give us the typical way we see things. Because actually, when you look at the world from a single point, uh, you end up seeing the world with, with some perspective uh, deformation. So our, our eyes, our visual system sort of looks like this, especially if you look from one eye. You, you see the world from, from that point, from the perspective of that point, and everything will be deformed, will have perspective deformation like this. So objects that are closer to us will appear larger, and objects that are further away from us will appear smaller. So that's how the perspective projection works. When we would like to be able to represent something like this. All right. The way we're going to do that is that we're going to apply perspective projection and perspective projection is going to change the way that we're going from the view space to the canonical view volume. So it's just going to change that component. Everything else is going to be the same. We're just going to change that very component. All right. So here's my lovely camera. And imagine that I am looking at that virtual world through the screen from this camera. Right. And, and when I look at the world, from this camera through the screen, what what will I see? I'll I'll see this portion, right? So I'll, it's going to be an extending portion. This is this is what I will be seeing. So you can think about the 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 perspective view volume like this. So it's like a like a pyramid. Well, you 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 chop the beginning of it. Uh, so this is going to be my view volume. And when I say perspective deformation or perspective distortion, this is what I mean. So things where I'm not in a box anymore, but it's, it's like a more pyramid shape. And there's going to be what we call perspective distortion or perspective deformation, because I'm going to take this box and I am going to move this into the canonical view volume. In canonical view volume, I'm going to have a box from minus one to one for all dimensions, right? Uh, so that's going to be, that's going to apply some deformation to the scene, such that objects that are closer will get larger, right? Objects that are further away will get smaller uh, because of the perspective distortion. All right, so this is the, the coordinate frame in, in camera space, right? This is what we're going to be modifying. So we're going to take this and we're going to transform this into, with perspective transformation, uh, we're going to go into canonical view volume that will look like this. The way that we're going to go to the canonical view volume is that it's going to have two steps. First step is going to be a perspective transformation. And after the perspective transformation, we're going to apply orthographic projection. 
So the perspective projection includes two steps, perspective transformation and then orthographic projection. So the goal of the perspective transformation is to take this and transform it into something that looks like this. All right. And then the rest can be handled using orthographic projection. So here, uh, if I have these, these lines, they're originating from the origin and going through this volume. Uh, they're, not, they're not parallel lines, right? They're not parallel in this space. But after I apply the perspective transformation, they're going to turn into parallel lines. So let's take a look at it from a, a 2D cross section. So I'm just showing the Y and Z axes here. The, the X axis is towards you. Yes, it's towards you. Uh, so what we're going to do is that we're going to apply some transformation that's going to go from, from this to this, right? Because the, uh, these lines are going to be parallel. Now I could pick, pick any point. I, I, I wanted to, um, align everything at this near plane here in front of my camera. And that's how I'm going to define the, the perspective projection. But yeah, I could be arbitrarily picking any plane. I could be using it in the far plane. In that case, it would be over here. Yeah. It doesn't matter mathematically. That will, that will cancel out. So don't worry about it. But I, I just picked this near plane. And I'm going to make sure that the, this direction that enters this V volume from this point, after I apply the transformation, uh, we'll have the, the same distance from, uh, from this view direction. All right. So over here in the near plane, I have, I'm going to have the same distance as in the far plane over here. So that's the, that's the idea. So I'm going to transform everything to that coordinate frame. So if I have a position P here, uh, the Y component of that vector P is going to be P Y and it's Z component is going to be PZ. So for all points along this line, uh, for all points along this line, you will, uh, you should see that, uh, the ratio PY or PZ is going to be the same, right? For, for all points along this line, for all points along this line, PY over PZ is the same. Uh, and we're going to use that for, taking this point and finding its, its position in, in the transformation. What we're going to do is that we're going to figure out where it lands on this, this horizontal line, right? That horizontal line has this, uh, height over here. Let's call it P Y prime. So that is a point along this line, right? If it's a point along this line, I can, I can do the math and say, oh, P Y prime is supposed to be, uh, P Y or P Z multiplied by N. Okay. And that's going to give us what P Y prime is supposed to be. I can do the same thing for, 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 for P X prime in the X direction, uh, again, multiplied by the, the near plane. And I'm multiplying by the near plane because I, I picked that one as where I align these two lines. <sighs> okay. So that basically gives me a transformation that looks like this, right? For, for, for any point, I am going to be multiplying that for any vector, any given vector to find the corresponding position here. I'm going to be multiplying that vector with this. I multiply by N divide by its Z components. Whoa, this is interesting. Now I'm not multiplying the, the, by a constant value, I'm multiplying by its Z component. How can I do that? Here's how we do this. We're going to extend our definition of homogeneous coordinates. Now I'm going to say that, well, originally we were saying homogeneous coordinates would have one here, right? At the, the fourth coordinate would be one. Uh, when I'm extending this definition now, I'm saying that any vector that has some value, let's call it alpha here, uh, that has some value. Uh, if I divide all of the X, Y, and Z components by this value, I'm going to get an equivalent position in 3D. 
Now, this is a 4D representation of a 3D position, right? I added an additional dimension. The additional dimension is over here. Now, this is defining in this four-dimensional space a three-dimensional projection of four-dimensional points in this four-dimensional space. So basically what it's saying is that for all points uh, in a line in 4D, yeah, I'm, I'm basically saying that they are the same point in 3D. So for any, uh, for given any vector, multiply all of its components by the same scalar, including this, this fourth uh, component here, I get the same point in 3D. This is my definition of homogeneous coordinates. This is how I go from four-dimensional space to the three-dimensional space, all right? So all of these points with different alpha values here will be exactly the same point in 3D. That's how I defined it. So if I want to know exactly this X, Y, and Z components, what they're supposed to be, what I need to do is I'm just going to have to divide everything by whatever this is, all right? And this will allow me to do this operation. So what I would like to do when I'm doing perspective projection perspective transformation is that I would like to be able to take these these x y, and y components and multiply by n divide by the z components. Now I haven't decided what to do with the the z component. It's going to be something. We'll, we'll get there. But I know what I'm going to do with x and y, right? I know x and y is supposed to be this. Now I can't quite do that with a nice mat matrix vector multiplication, but what I can do is I can compute an equivalent point in four dimension if I use homogeneous coordinates. I can compute this point. I can compute this fairly easily. And here I have PZ here, right, as my fourth coordinate. And these other components are going to be n times PZ and n times PY. So this is equivalent to this because that's how I define my homogeneous coordinates, all right? So I, I can use this operation to, to simplify my perspective projection or to represent my perspective projection in uh, homogeneous coordinates. So let's do perspective transformation using this, using this homogeneous coordinates. So actually fairly easy, right? It's going to be a matrix that will look very much like this. So X and Y will be multiplied by N and they will be divided by the Z component, so I just put it over here. So in the end, now I'm saying this is equivalent, but when I when I multiply, Z will end up at the, the that component, at the, the fourth component, so it's effectively dividing everything by, by Z. Right? So that's how I do my perspective transformation. Now, what do I do? What do I do with for computing the p prime z. Now, ideally, I would like that to not change at all. Like, why, why would I change the z component? I mean, I know that for perspective transformation, I'm going to deform things in x and y direction, but z, I don't want any deformation. Like, why do I care? I'm going to apply some orthographic projection to go from whatever space I end up after perspective transformation to the canonical v volume. But beyond that, I don't really want to touch the z component at all. But I am going to be touching the z component because I just took that z, I, I just took this with, with the bottom row here, I changed the fourth component. So whatever I put in the fourth component here will be divided by the z value. So I am going to be messing things up a little bit. Um, so the way that we're going to handle this is that I'm going to do such a transformation here for the z component that when z is, when pz is at the near plane, I'm still going to get the near plane value n. And when z is at the far plane, far f, I'm still going to get the uh, far value f. And in between, I'm going to get in between values. So yeah, the, the z values will be modified a little bit because I'm going to end up having this the division operation. Uh, but the, the transformation that I'm going to be doing for z is going to preserve the z values as much as possible with some linear transformation, of course. So 
this is what we're going to be using for that. So if you just do the math over here, you'll see that when uh, the z component is n, uh, you know, the z, the z component is n, I will end up getting this thing multiplied by pz minus, minus fn is multiplied by 1 divided by pz because everything will be divided by pz and that will give me this right and you know pz is uh n that's how we defined it and that simplifies to this which is which is n right same goes for when uh pz is is f at the at the far plane uh, that's equivalent to, to writing this, which simplifies down to f. So I, I basically preserved the, the very near and very far z values and everything in between will be deformed a little bit, uh, but we're trying to minimize it. Now with this, here's how I'm going to be defining perspective projection. You take your perspective space, like the camera, uh, camera space or view space, and you apply perspective transformation that looks like this. And that brings you to, to an, um, a, a space where I applied perspective transformation or perspective deformation. From that point on, I'm going to apply an orthographic projection just like we did before. And that's going to give us uh, the, the final transformation. Right? So you can think about this in the, the, the reverse order. <laughs> From here, I went to... So I'm writing it in reverse order because that's how you should write the matrices, right? So I'm going to be multiplying with this matrix first. I'm going to first apply the perspective transformation. And then I'm going to apply the orthographic projection. And that's how I will get my perspective projection, right? So these are, again, the two projection options, orthographic projection and perspective projection. And they're going to be very, very useful and helpful for the stuff that we're going to be doing. Now, I believe what I did uh, just now is I went through about one, two, three, four, five lectures of introduction to computer graphics in this one lecture. Uh, so I had to skip some of the details, but most of the details are there, at least the stuff that I thought would be very, very relevant and important for, for this course, for interactive computer graphics. Yeah, so this is the stuff that I wanted to cover today. And next time, I'm going to be talking about uh, rendering algorithms. Um, and we're going to start talking about the GPU pipeline. We're going to talk about rasterization and, and ray tracing. And uh, I'm going to explain that we're sort of stuck with rasterization on the GPU. And we're going to talk about how that GPU rasterization pipeline looks like. All right, so... This is where I'm going to end. Now, this is a good place to end it. Uh, I'll see you all next week. Um, and stay safe.